Good evening, everybody. Um, I am, my name is Justin. I'm a sophomore studying finance and management information systems here at the university. Um, I'm the vice president of our school's cryptocurrency club. Um, over there is Ethan. He's our president of our uh, local club. We are so thrilled to be hosting this event and uh, having the Dash to Tales team here. It's, um, it's, it's really a great opportunity for us. So first, I'm just going to be setting the context for um, partially about what well, we're on the news lately about what Zcash was in the launch. Um, but I'm just going to be talking about how many people have different solutions for how they've taken Bitcoin and implemented it in ways that they um, think are most effective or help to solve a problem. And so I'm just going to kind of go over like why the problem exists and what people have done for a solution for these problems. So first, uh, I'd like to point out that Bitcoin is not anonymous. It is one of the most transparent forms of money that has ever been created. So when any transaction happens with Bitcoin, it goes specifically from one address to the other address without any uh, obscuring at all. And so this means that you might not specific, uh, specifically know who controls this address, but Coinbase or another exchange likely will. And as machine learning gets more and more complex, uh, it's kind of a race against the clock. So even if you find ways to um, protect yourself now, Going into the future, you can always retroactively look at the entire blockchain and figure that data out. So, that being said, uh, like I said, every, everyone can see a record of every Bitcoin transaction ever and will continue to until uh, they make some changes, which probably might not actually happen. <laughs> um, so yeah, one, one, one point I'd like to make is that if Ethan, uh, for some reason, gets tainted money from somewhere, so Bitcoin that was used for an illicit purpose, and then gives the money to me, and then someone finds out that that Bitcoin was used in a negative way, everybody in the entire world would know that that Bitcoin was used for an illicit purpose. So to me, the money is useless, and I lost out. Even though I haven't done anything illegal, I'm the victim here because I have money that I can't actually use. So, and like the point is that if I had tainted money, none of you would want to take it because then it would expose you, right? So, an example here, person one to person two in an illegal exchange, which, again, don't uh, endorse those. Uh, but then, an illegal exchange here, right, um, when the federal government or some entity steps in, then these people are all arrested or questioned, and the money this person has, he can't actually use the Bitcoin anymore. So the money is actually useless to this person. So, fungibility, right? Uh, this is just a property where one coin is worth the same as another coin, and they cannot be discriminated against. This is like the U.S. dollar that you specifically have in your pocket with cash. It is fungible because you don't care where the money came from. There's no written amount on the on the dollar where it came from. Instead, it's just this is my money, and I can use it for purposes that I'm making. So. One thing straight, drugs aren't the only illegal things that people can do. Uh, in some countries, um, they can be used to prohibit people from purchasing specific things. Uh, for example, uh, things like birth control or banned books that speak against the government. Also, with campaign contributions, if I make a contribution in Bitcoin this, uh, to one political party, another political party can notice that I donated money to that party and then contact me and either threaten me or ask why I did that. Uh, and then, of course, another illegal purpose could be money laundering. So, with Bitcoin, everybody knows how much money you have. So, the U.S. government can ask Coinbase how much money I have, so they can look at my information and then compare it to my Bitcoin address, and they can see how much I have. And if any, if I publish my Bitcoin address to all of you, you could all see all the purchases that I have ever made for all of my history within Bitcoin too, right? So, this is clearly a situation where many people have decided that there's more privacy that they would like to have, and there are many proposed solutions towards this problem. I'm going to kind of go into those on a superficial, on a broad level to begin with. So first, people took the original Bitcoin protocol and decided, let's add something on top of it. Let's add something that we call mixers. This is where you send money, you give money to somebody, they jump, a lot of other people give money to one person too. They jumble all this money up, all the Bitcoins together, in what they call either a blender or a mixer. <coughs> and they send you back random ones, and they promise that they'll delete the logs. Uh, the benefits of this is it, makes, it does make it harder to trace where the Bitcoin came from, and it adds some level of plausible deniability, but there is also a lot of negatives, right? 
You have to trust the mixer when you're giving them the money that they'll actually give you your coins back. Uh, they, have to, um, they have to actually trust the recipient of the Bitcoin to mix their coins because there's another vulnerability there. There's the fee that you have to incur by the person who's providing the service. And if people have to opt in to use these Bitcoin miners, uh, these, I'm sorry, these Bitcoin mixers, then people who use these services are the ones that are going to be targeted because it looks suspicious. Kind of like how in China, if you tried to run Tor, uh, they, the, federal, the government there wouldn't really like it that much. Um, and then also it takes some time because you actually need to wait for people to mix with. So today we have the Dash Tail team. They're speaking about Dash. Um, they have optional private transactions with their private send protocol. Um, these are operated by Masternode Dash holders. So they basically took uh, a similar implementation of Bitcoin mixing called CoinJoin, and they implemented it on the actual network so that you can choose to have your coins mixed by these master nodes. Um, so this way you can, it removes a lot of the negatives. So for example, the money won't be, there's no threat of really being stolen anymore. And DAPS as a general has a large operating marketing budget and they have a really strong community behind them. They're one of the strongest uh, uh, cryptocurrencies as far as communities are concerned. And another benefit, which uh, I'm sure they'll get into later, is that they have another feature called Instant Send. So you can directly send transactions instantly where they need to con be confirmed just by the master nodes instead of waiting for the full block time for it to be mined. However, um, currently you still need to trust the master nodes. Um, and uh, this is kind of with any uh, proof of work, uh, I'm sorry, proof of stake system. And then um, again, if you're opting in to use a service, um, it, it's going to differentiate you from people who are not actually opting in to use a service. Um, and then for the last bullet point, that I put that in a different color because this, there's a lot of advantages to this too. But when they mine, only 45% of the awards go to the miners. That's because another 45% go towards the master node, so they operate these services. And then 10% goes towards a community fund, which is voted upon by the master nodes for where they get to uh, use their money towards development and other opportunities. Um, Monero, uh, they use, on a protocol level, they use ring signatures to ensure plausible deniability. Um, so the difference here with many coins is that it's the one where it's actually private by default. So every trend, it's, it's impossible with Monero to send a transaction that doesn't mix with other, uh, with other people. So that way, everyone who is using it, uh, it, that way people don't stick out like a sore thumb. The problem here, though, is that it's not easy to use. Um, it's still on the graphical, it's still uh, on, it's still in command line usage, so it hasn't received much mass adoption yet. And also one security feature that is required to make it more, uh, more private has not been implemented yet, it's still going to be pushed back until January. And then a new feature that was introduced, uh, a new uh, negative that was introduced by that was that when you send transactions, if you send one transaction using uh, their new technology they implemented to make it more private, you need to wait uh, for multiple block confirmation before you can actually send money again. So it really, if you're trying to send money to multiple people rapidly, it really, you, you'd have to use multiple wallets. So that's a major downside. Zcash, this one was just in the news because it launched this month. And for a moment, the valuation <laughs> of it was very high. Um, it still is, uh, relatively largely valued, but it has declined significantly over the past few weeks. Um, in theory, it is more private than the other options I've listed because it uses new tech, new cryptography in order to, uh, called ZK snarks. Um, I don't really know how they work. And that's part of the problem is that nobody really knows how they work yet. So Zero knowledge proof, right? Correct. Yeah. So yeah. the best way I can explain it is that you send money, in, you optionally send money basically into a black hole and then it comes out and then people just kind of take your word for it that it went through. So it's much, there's, it's much harder to audit the blockchain. Um, one negative I have here is that um, when th it requires a trusted setup. So six people, when they started Zcash this month, got together, um, they each got like basically one sixth of the code that controlled the money supply, and we're relying on them to completely destroy that portion of the code. Um, because if they collude, they could generate an infinite number of coins, and nobody would know that they're actually generating coins based off how private it is. So 
This is kind of more so where it's looking in the future for coins possibly, but right now it is still brand new and we don't really know how it'll turn out. So, in summary, uh, Bitcoin mixers are still better than nothing, but they still carry risk. Um, Dash uh, introduces a few new issues, but it is, I would say it's definitely better than a mixer, and it has a lot of new cool features, and they're really implementing a lot of those cool new features. Um, Monero has genuinely good cryptography, but it's really difficult to use, and it is definitely not finished. Um, and there's a little bit less uh, de developer participation. And with Zcash, it's new technology uh, that is kind of looking into how things might look in the future, but it's unlikely to succeed. And one thing I forgot to note too about Zcash is that it is controlled by a specific uh, company, whereas the rest are all uh, are all open source projects. Yeah. You forgot to mention one way to anonymize bitcoins that works okay. really well and is very easy, and that is air gapping, breaking the chain. So some wallets like Jax allow you to, using Shapeshift, change Bitcoins to Dash. Mm -hmm. And then you can change your <coughs> Dash back yeah. to Bitcoin, exactly. and all of a sudden the, the, so, so the trail use, is broken. Correct. You could use, um, so a few things. One, note that Shapeshift will keep logs. They've specifically announced that they are... Damn them. They are fully <laughs> compliant. They are based in the US, and they're fully compliant on their... No, so they they're based in Sweden. All, they keep all that information. They're based in Switzerland, oh, but they do publicly um, yeah. show all logs. Yeah. I'll talk to so, he's about that. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, you will. But yes, you could you could use in order to anonymize Bitcoin, you could definitely use a different cryptocurrency such as Dash Monero or Zcash to do that. Um, just make sure you have two hops instead of one. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Maybe use an exchange and then Yeah. yeah. Not, well, Zcash you can't use Jax, yeah, because Jax enabled the T address version, not the Z address yeah. version. Basically, all the, mm -hmm. which is not private transaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so with Zcash, it's another one of those, you have to opt in to actually use the private transactions. And since it's so new, um, they're still working on support for that, too. So the sort answer is nothing is perfectly anonymous yet, but we're working to get there, and it's a strong initiative that we're working towards. Um, so that's a general thing. Okay. Real quick, before I know. I bounce it over. Right. The other, the other thing is, you, you mentioned that if you use a public a Bitcoin address and put it in the public, then people will know how much money is on that address. Correct. True, but modern day wallets all have hierarchical deterministic, so you have multiple addresses every time you use it. I, yes. They can tell how much is on your one address, but not how much is in your wallet. But then, as soon as but you, you send the transaction, it links the inputs, and they can tell yeah. that they all came from the same wallet. Yeah. yeah, so if it sends it from one wallet to another, in any way... Just the inputs, though. There may be other addresses in there, private keys, that have different inputs, but... Well, yeah. once you create the link... Yeah, yeah. so, and, and remember, too, even if something might be considered now to be an acceptable solution, right. it's reported on the blockchain forever. Right. So, just keep that in mind. Okay, <clears throat> so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Amanda, which is here from the Dash Detail team. She's going to be speaking about how uh, she's working with her project in order to um, build communities, right? Something like that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me try. <laughs> yeah. And I just want to say, it appears um, that the pizza that has been a surprise gift to us by Greg from Twitter, that's what I call him, Greg from Twitter, a longtime follower of my work, uh, super glad that you made the substantial drive here this evening, Greg. He's brought us all pizza, and I think it would be better to eat it hot than cold. So I would invite any of you who would like some to just go grab it. Uh, there are plates here on this front table. And then just come back and have a seat, and I'll chat with you while you eat pizza. So, like, in like five minutes, let us reconvene. And also, bring us here. All right. Are we all ready to reconvene? It's amazing. Yes. All right. Well, thanks again for the pizza, Greg. And thanks again to Ethan and Justin for hosting us, uh, the production team of Dash Details. For anybody who doesn't know, I am the host and writer of a weekly YouTube series that's published on Wednesdays called Dash to Tales. I'm sure you'll see a card on the table in front of you. 
And then the other half of my team is the bearded one in the back. That's the my man one. servant Pete Ayer, <laughs> who is actually from Minnesota. So this is pretty circuitous for us. And special thanks to Pete's parents there in the back for coming out to this nerd fest. Yes. Yeah. That's what it is. Yes. Yeah, very good. So it is so uh, prescient, I guess if that's the right word, that your theme for this evening is privacy on a blockchain. And you, uh, Justin, you pointed out so aptly like the reasons that someone would want that. I remember when I uh, first discovered Bitcoin and started playing around with it, I guess this was like mid-2013, I had never like looked at a blog explorer or anything, right? Like, so I, I didn't, I didn't understand that like if you, for example, keep using the same address, Yes, literally everything you've ever done, everything you've ever like sent and received is like the most public thing ever. I remember the first time I like used a block explorer to look at my own Bitcoin address. I was I was stunned. I was horrified at the mistake I had made. Not to mention embarrassed. In fact, I think this is the first time I mentioned it in public. Um, and and yes, like just as Justin mentioned, um, like finances are private. Like if I asked any of you your bank account balance, you'd be, you would think I was so rude. You wouldn't want to be my friend. It's just not a thing that people do. We just don't ask one another our bank account balances. And so if a system exists that enables us to be our own bank, certainly it should afford us at least the privacy that banks do now, right? I mean, at least with a bank account, only like the bank employees and anyone they show their books to knows the balances. Whoever hacks them. Pardon? And whoever hacks them. And that, uh, right? <laughs> which, is, which is actually, Doug, it's so, um, it's so important that you point that out also, because as I'm going to discuss for the remainder of the time, I'm going to be up here like 25 or 30 minutes or something, uh, I'm going to discuss how certain things need to be in place in cryptocurrency in order for the average person to feel that they can actually keep their own private keys. Because if every person is holding on to their own private keys, because they feel empowered to be their own bank and they don't need, like, for example, Coinbase holding their keys because Coinbase is way easy to use compared to like, like a legit Bitcoin desktop wallet. And unless cryptocurrency is as easy to use as Coinbase or like PayPal, there's just no way that the average person is ever going to feel comfortable like holding on to the entirety of their own wealth when like hacking incidents are are major and you, and you don't even have to get hacked because because if you don't know how cryptocurrency works and let's not kid ourselves that like the whole world is going to get interested in blockchain technology learn about public private key cryptography like that's just not happening right if it doesn't feel like paypal it's not going to get the user base of paypal like the end so privacy on a blockchain it turns out that if a system is actually honest about its monetary supply, as a blockchain should be and can be, then the best that can be done in terms of obscuring how much money you have and, and where it's been sent and where it's come from, <coughs> the best that can be done for any given coin is to just cast doubt on where that coin came from. Like basically to cause uncertainty by putting your coins in a pool of many other people's coins. So it turns out that on a blockchain, the maximum uncertainty that can be granted your coins is limited by the number of users on that network who, who also use the privacy feature of that coin. So if you're using a network that has like 100 active users who do the privacy right on it, like the maximum uncertainty you can achieve for your finances is like one out of 100. Same if the network has a thousand users and on and on. And so when looked at in that light, uh, we see that it's actually paramount that there are as many users as possible because the easiest way to blend into a crowd is for that crowd to be very, very large. And what's more, that's all on blockchain, right? But as Justin also mentioned, like like in real life, the best way to blend in like 
in person, if you'd like your finances to be private, is not to be like, hey, do you accept drug dealer coin? It's so private. No, but right? But like to be using a coin which is super private, but also that like a lot of people use so that you don't like stand out there either. Blending into the crowd is, is what it's about in terms of achieving privacy on a ledger which is completely honest about its monetary supply. So, with all of these things in mind, the reason, I don't know if any of y'all know this, like Pete and I used to have a show called The Daily Decrypt, it's maybe where some of y'all first saw us. Oh, gee! Nirvana! Nirvana! Oh, that's funny. Thank you. And um, it was in the course of doing that show that I just like dove so deep into like all these competitors, right? Because the theme of The Daily Decrypt was currency competition. And so I was like, shoot, if I'm going to be like comparing them all the time, like I want to know everything there is to know. And we now work on a show called Dash Details. Why would we make that switch? Like why would we go from being like blockchain agnostic to being like, no, we would like to work for Dash in particular. And the reason being is basically what I'm going to share with you tonight, which is that I'm going to, I'm going to operate on a hypothesis here. And if you don't agree with me, and you might not, I would just invite you to just like entertain the hypothesis just for like the next 20 or 25 minutes. And then if you still don't like it at the end, just like leave it at the door, right? And that hypothesis is that cryptocurrency networks are and must function like businesses in order to succeed in the long term, potentially even medium term. And what do I mean by that? Well, there are three categories that I think that Dash ticks the checkboxes on, basically, that I think will be required for mass adoption. And if there isn't mass adoption of some kind, then why are, like, why are we even here, right? Like, we're all going to lose. If anybody in this room, like, owns cryptocurrency, <laughs> if there's not a mass adoption of something, eventually, like, you're going to lose your money, and this is going to have been a bubble. And, like, the way that people talk about, like, tulip mania back in the day or whatever, this will be called cryptomania. And we'll be put in the history books as the people who bought into cryptomania. Woo! Don't want that to happen. No, no, no. <laughs> so in order for that not to happen, I think that there are like three primary things that a crypto needs to have going for it. The first being what I will call, for lack of a better term, um, business fundamentals. And I'll get into those. The second would be what I would call, oh, hold on, I just had a little tiny brain fart. Oh, yes. Uh, user experience, as I mentioned earlier, like something like PayPal, because we, we, can, we cannot delude ourselves that the whole world is going to, I don't even know cryptography. Raise your hand if you're a cryptography expert. Not even in this room, not even in the cryptocurrency club is there a cryptography expert. Okay, that's, that's serious. Okay, so definitely like, the whole world is not going to become a cryptography expert to use like blockchain-based currencies. And then the third checkbox is what I have dubbed actually the, the name of tonight's presentation of mine, uh, which is decentralizing all of the profits of that network. So I'm going to start with number one being business fundamentals. I would like for you to envision, and maybe this is simplistic, and maybe you think this is childish, but I think that if something cannot be taught to a child, it means that the teacher teaching it doesn't actually understand what it is that they're saying. So I would like for you to envision a storage facility. Because a blockchain can kind of be compared to a storage facility in that its entire purpose is to store like a record of account a continually updated and accurate record of account. So I just want you to think of like a storage facility. Maybe they store boxes or something, I don't know. And they have like employees, like anything does. Let's say uh, this, this storage facility has like forklift operators. They ship the boxes of information out the door. Uh, let's say they have like shelf stackers. Those are the people who like organize the boxes of information on the shelves. And then there will be like the administrative, like the office workers or something, right? All I'm getting at here is that any productive enterprise has multiple class classes of employees. And 
it just so happens that cryptocurrency totally has these. Cryptocurrency has miners. Cryptocurrency has full nodes. And cryptocurrency has developers. In every and nearly every implementation of digital currency aside from Dash, one class of employees eats up all of the profits, like the forklift operators. In the case of cryptocurrency, it just so happens to be miners. And not only do they get all of the coin creation, but they get all of the fees. Like, literally every scrap of revenue that is created by the network is entirely consumed by the miners. And this creates a sort of situation. I'll talk about Bitcoin in this particular instance, primarily because it has like the biggest market cap by far, right? And so like anything that happens in Bitcoin is way more noticeable. But what if Monero had Bitcoin's market cap? If Ethereum had Bitcoin's market cap, if any of these other networks in which the miners consume the entirety of the profits had Bitcoin's market cap, the same thing would be happening. The first thing that happens when miners consume all of the network's revenue is that um, full nodes begin to gradually drop off. And I'm going to get like a little bit Close your ears if you don't care about technicalities, but for those of you who do, just listen to like 30 seconds. If you ever read the Bitcoin white paper, once upon a time, there was no difference between a node and a miner. Like when Satoshi designed Bitcoin, it was to be mined on CPUs. So everybody was a full node, everybody was mining, and that was the way it was. And then fast forward a little while later, like mining pools were invented, as were light wallets. And all of a sudden, like, only a few professionals are mining, and so that would leave, what, maybe like 10 nodes like, in the whole world or something? And so being a node, being a full node, which is so important, not only are they, like, keeping copies of the ledger in various parts around the world, right, to give us redundancy, but they're also relaying, like, they're also relaying everybody's transactions back and forth to each other so that we can remain in consensus. Uh, that is now, because it's no longer being subsidized by mining and nodes are a separate thing, in Bitcoin, for example, I believe there was one point when there were like tens and tens of thousands of full nodes, which is excellent redundancy. Um, but it has plummeted to something like 5,500 full nodes. And that trend will likely continue because they are like the factory's shelf stackers who are not getting a paycheck because the forklift operators are consuming all of the profits. And a declining node count is not desirable. The second thing that happens when one employee class consumes all of the profits is like these office workers that we talked about in our storage facility. Maybe they're the people who, I don't know, decide what kind of forklifts are used, uh, who order the forklifts. Basically the parallel I'm trying to make is like cryptocurrency developers who develop the code base which is an extraordinarily important job because the, the protocol, right? Did, did anybody, did you ever think about um, the fact that the word protocol is like a synonym for rule set? So like the developers are like literally writing the rules? That's a big position to be having. And what happens when that position is unpaid is that, I mean, okay, so developers can command quite the salary. Their programming is, is, a sweet, is a sweet gig to have. Um, and if you're the kind of person who can command a serious salary, but you're, you're developing on a cryptocurrency network that doesn't pay you any portion of its revenue stream, uh, you are quite susceptible to being sponsored by third parties. In Bitcoin, again, just to go back to the example of our largest market cap here, in Bitcoin, for a while, development was being funded by the Bitcoin Foundation, which was getting donations from various people uh, who were rather wealthy. And, and as anybody does, when you give money, when you sponsor someone, when you donate, when you whatever, like you expect something in return, uh, generally. And, and even if you don't, it's like your influence uh, is, is going to happen because these developers want to keep getting paid, you're the hand that feeds. Nobody's going to bite the hand that feeds. 
And so, like, when the Bitcoin Foundation started it, rah, 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 like, not be so reliable, then, like, MIT comes in and is, like, sponsoring Bitcoin Core development. And it's like, all right, like, what's in it for MIT? Like, what, what do they want? Right? What is, what's their influence going to be? Fast forward to that, uh, this, this brand new corporation is formed called Blockstream. And they get like so much money um, from interests which perhaps would not benefit from like a peer-to-peer -peer digital currency that everybody can use, but rather would benefit from like say like a back end to banks. That's how they would get a return on their investment. These sorts of things. And all of a sudden you begin to see like shoot, like if developers aren't paid, whoever ends up paying them is is of course going to have a great deal of influence. Hello, welcome. Hello. welcome. As they should. And so the question then becomes, if we have a network revenue, how can we pay everybody? Can we make it so like the please, like the forklift operators like stop making it so that A, these people like like the nodes are like totally volunteers and we see them dwindling and we're like, please, please keep running a full node. And then like the developers were like, hey, go find your own paycheck. And the answer, of course, is just to split up the block reward. Block reward makes it sound like it's like this fancy technical thing, but what if we call block reward just like profits? Okay, then it becomes like so obvious that that everybody working in a company should get a share of profits. So I'll just talk to you about how Dash has done that. Anybody, of course, can do this. Anybody can incorporate anything into a competing cryptocurrency. This is all open source, right? If any of you, like, at the end of this evening, think like, "Oh, most of what Dash is doing sounds cool," but you know, this one thing, and like, I implore you to like fork Dash and like start a competing network. Maybe you'll do a better job, <laughs> and maybe I'll be asking you for a job one day, right? Because I'm. I'm not married to like any particular cryptocurrency. Like I just want to be on the team that's like doing the very best job out of existing options. So in Dash, the way that everybody is paid is that, as Justin mentioned earlier, 45% of the block reward goes to our miners, rather than 100%, right? 45% goes to our master nodes, and then 10% is left over to hire and potentially fire, if we want, our developers. And the way that that 10% is allocated is based on stakeholder vote, basically. And so like if one of our core developers started acting up, we could absolutely fire them with a majority vote. We could absolutely rehire somebody else who might be doing a better job. But development uh, is not the only thing that can be funded. Uh, Dash Detailed is funded directly from Dash's block reward. It's so wild. Like the first time I checked a block explorer to like see our, our payout, it says like like generated coins in the memo field. It was like like being like it's like mining the videos basically. It's so cool. And we can do this for anybody. We can hire and or like if we don't want to fire anybody, but sometimes that happens. Uh, we can hire anybody with this 10% of the block reward and, and do it via a vote. And so those two things, to use the parlance of the what some call the legacy economy, uh, taking care of payroll uh, basically covers the business fundamental one. And business fundamental two, I'll use the probably the most unglamorous word you'll hear this evening, at which is governance. It's getting thrown around a lot more these days because poor governance models are starting to suffer greater and greater crises. And governance just basically means like, how do we make a decision network-wide? It would be one thing if the code for digital currencies were like unchangeable, then we wouldn't have to worry about governance. There are no decisions to be made. It's set in stone. But this stuff is all open source, so anything's up for changing. And if we're talking about a competitive market, like a, a currency market, like if your competitor comes out with some cool new thing or whatever, I mean, you only have so long to like respond to that, maybe like push out like a new development or whatever. I mean, 
how, think about how traditional companies work. Like, like what if for the last three years, Samsung like had been at a gridlock for how large like the screen for their next phone should be? That's insane. Like there would be no Samsung. There has to be something in place that allows the entire network to make decisions together. And the reason this is so befuddling for a lot of us is because it's just a new way to run a business now. Like, whereas with Samsung, they probably have a board of, like, developers that can be like, let's have a meeting to talk about what the next phone should look like. We're all in the same room, we know each other by name, it's easy. But then, like, you get into blockchain land and it's like, I don't know who runs a node. I don't know who the miners are. I've never met the developers. How do we make decisions with people we've never met? You just, you just have to invent a new way to do it. And so, the second business fundamental that I believe Dash covers is uh, blockchain-based voting, I guess is a way of putting it. But, but more accurately, it's that every person who owns a masternode, they get one vote on everything, both to how much we pay core developers, to what should our block size cap be, to should Dash Detailed have their contract renewed after their six months expires or not. And, and the reason it's seen that master nodes, the reason we give them voting rights basically, is because they do three things for us which we think are very important and which we think will most properly incentivize them to make wise decisions. <laughs> One, and probably the most important, is that each of them has proven that they own a thousand dash. Which means that if they make poor decisions, they stand to personally suffer from it. <clears throat> By the same token, if they make wise decisions, they stand to personally gain from it. And then the second two things that they do are, also as Justin mentioned, they give our network its main functionalities, like its main benefits over Bitcoin. Which in this case are the ability to get an instant confirmation, if you pay the instant confirmation fee. Uh, so the Masternode network executes instant send, is what we call it. And the second thing that they do is they, um, they allow for private send, which is the coin mixing that Justin mentioned. And if, in case you don't know how that works, I mean, I'm sure it's like largely cryptographic or whatever, but without revoking your private keys, you can just like tell your wallet, like, I would like to mix these coins with my peers. And somehow, I don't know how, but like re retaining the private keys the entire time, at the end of the mixing section, session, you end up with a different set of private keys entirely. And so, and so that's how the mixing works. So in exchange for doing these services for us, and for having a collateral of a thousand dash, which shows us that they have a stake in the outcome of their votes, master notes get to vote on everything. So, that wraps up like the entirety of point one, like what I called business fundamentals. Boring term, but uh, not, not so boring functionality. Certainly these aren't the kinds of things that like Bloomberg is gonna call us about, right? Or like Huffington Post or like Yahoo Finance. They're not gonna be like, Dash, tell us about your fabulous business fundamentals and governance. No, because nobody cares about these things and that's fine. They don't need to care about these things. That's fine. We'll take care of it so that we can have a marketable product for them later. Which takes me to point two, the user experience. Since we've already established that not only is there not even anybody in this room who is a cryptography expert, much less is the market at large full of cryptography experts, um, the Dash core team, actually it was sparked when the lead developer, his name is Evan Duffield, he lives in Phoenix. Uh, he founded Dash also in January of 2014. Uh, he like sat down with his mom one day to use the Dash Core wallet and just kind of like sat back and like watched her try to do things. And just like took note of her reactions and like of course she thought that cryptographic addresses were hideous and awful because they are. And like she didn't know what was what, and she and and Evan like so wisely was like, okay, if I, if if I actually want like Dash to be like a widely adopted substitute for like dollars, I mean the hubris required to even like aspire to such a thing actually is staggering. 
if, if I want to compete with like fiat money, it's gonna have to like feel like it. It can't be confusing. It can't be like intimidating. And, and if the only alternative out there is to like create a Coinbase account so that like Coinbase can make it easy for people, then we would be no better off than, than, than with the system we already have. Banks already do what Coinbase does. They hold your money, they'll send it back and forth when you tell them to, you hope, and you hope they don't close down your account. <coughs> Coinbase probably closes down more accounts than Bank of America. And I'm not even sure they give people's coins back all the time either. So we absolutely cannot rely on third parties to try to make cryptocurrency usable. That is just a recipe for disaster. Also, I think it might make, I think it might be easier to like hack repositories of cryptocurrency than it is to like because like okay, if Bank of America gets hacked, like I don't think that the I don't think their ledger gets like wiped or whatever. Like maybe customer details get spilled, maybe like an errant transaction or two gets initiated, but it's not like goodbye Bank of America's ledger, whereas like if a cryptocurrency exchange or whatever gets hacked, like the coins really are gone. They're just gone. And I read a stat the other day that said one third of all Bitcoin exchanges to date have been hacked. 33%. I think 33% of banks have been hacked to that magnitude? No. I think we can compete with them if we're really So in the second checkbox, the user experience, Evan Duffield and the rest of his team were just like, okay, can we have basically the PayPal experience, which is like usernames in place of cryptographic addresses, right? So instead of being like, Justin, you want to send me some Dash? Send it on over to X143B7G82. No, just be like, Justin, my Dash address is Amanda B. Johnson Wallet. Thanks. Right? Like actual reusable usernames. And, and, oh, oh, should I mention recurring monthly payments? Like think about how many of your expenses today are like auto-debited from like your bank or whatever. If cryptocurrency can't do that, can we really compete with banks? Um, just these sorts of things. If it doesn't feel like PayPal, if you can't do auto-debiting like PayPal, if you can't do all of these things, we're going to be severely lacking in a compelling use case for the average person. And so Evan Duffield and his team like invented and are currently, the last I read, I think they're halfway through the alpha coding of what they're calling evolution. And evolution is the name of the software that will be accessible via, of course, both um, web and mobile. But instead of it being like, like a third party service who is like, uh, you know, keeping their own copy of the blockchain, potentially holding your private keys, et cetera, et cetera, these apps, be they mobile or web, will be fed through what's being called the world's first decentralized API, which is basically like a code snippet that will let the people who own these web pages or the people who launch these mobile apps or whatever, will let them communicate directly with the Dash blockchain and like read and write to the Dash blockchain as though like they did have a full node. And what they will be able to communicate with is a layer that's being put on top of the regular Dash blockchain, which is being dubbed Dash Drive. And in Dash Drive will live user credentials, namely usernames and passwords, so that anybody who wants to use like lightweight Dash, like Evolution, like you don't know you're using cryptocurrency Dash, will be able to have like a username and password that can log them in through any evolution provider, be it a mobile app, be it web, or whatever, and like interact directly with the Dash blockchain and not see cryptography, and be able to, uh, like if the merchant they're paying Dash is like in the Dash app store, they'll be able to set up recurring payments with them, which is brand new in cryptocurrency, by the way. It's called um, the poll mechanism, 
Right now, cryptocurrency is all push mechanism, which means uh, the only person who can initiate an, uh, a transfer from your account is yourself, because you hold the private keys. This is nice in some ways, but of course it also means that there's no potential of auto payments. If there's no potential of auto payments, we're going to have a very hard sell to a lot of business models out there. So another thing that Dash Evolution will enable is the pull mechanism, where if you have an agreement with a merchant, like you subscribe to their service, at 12 months of send me I love fishing magazine every month, like they'll be able to pull Dash out of your account once a month in accordance to how you've agreed for that to be allowed. And basically, if all goes as planned, if, you, if you're the kind of person who reads white papers, by the way, you can read a full specification of all of evolution at dash.org slash evolution. If all goes according to a plan, you should be able to sit pretty much anybody, you know, like your mother, your, your grandmother maybe, you should be able, ideally, should be, they should be able to sit down like on their computer, like go to like Dash Evolution and just like use it like like as though it were PayPal and not they don't need to know what cryptocurrency is. It's no good for us if they need to know what cryptocurrency is in order to use it. That's no good for us. So that takes care of the second box, which I call user experience. So we've knocked out the first box, business fundamentals, the non-glamorous stuff that no one will ever call us from Forbes and ask about. The second box, user experience. And the third box is what I call decentralizing all of the profits. It's interesting to me that if you like uh, think about what decentralization looks like in your head, maybe you get the vision of like, I don't know, like maybe like growth or something, or like, like new things popping up in new places. Um, and in that sense, like decentralization could be used synonymously with growth. I'm not aware of any business that doesn't want to grow. I'm not aware of any cryptocurrency network, which I would say is also a business that doesn't want to grow. And if, as I said at the beginning of this presentation, if the privacy on a blockchain is only as good as as many users as you have, it's absolutely imperative that we grow slash decentralize. Thing, potentially. And in Dash, we realized that um, mining is kind of like a professional class thing, right? I tried to mine once. There's a mining subreddit, and I wanted to like go to there to ask them questions so I could get started in mining. It's private. You have to like be invited in. So I like requested an invite to the mining subreddit. They wouldn't let me. In other words, mining is hard, right? Master noting is maybe like a little bit easier, but there is that there is that uh, hurdle of like having a thousand dash as collateral, which for many people is undoubtedly cost prohibitive. At today's prices, that's almost a I'm sorry, almost ten thousand dollars in dash, and so that of course will limit the growth of our infrastructure or the decentralization of our infrastructure to those who have $10,000 to invest to launch a masternode. And we don't want to be limited in our decentralization. And so also on the roadmap for Dash, I believe it's set for release in, it'll come after Evolution. Evolution is set for late 2017. So this will probably be 2018. Um, is what's being called decentralized masternode shares, which is just a fancy way of saying that if you don't own a thousand dash, you will be able to move whatever amount of dash you would like to what will look in the user interface like your savings account. <coughs> and in your savings account, all the while you retain your private keys, like a second private key or something, of everybody else who is also like saving some dash like once that reaches like a thousand like the protocol will like make that batch of dash available to like launch another master node and so someone who you know perhaps doesn't have any collateral whatsoever can like pull from this batch of dash for which they don't hold the private key and like launch a master node in exchange they get part of the payments 
And then everybody whose collateral is in it gets a proportional part of the payments as well. Now that sounds all very techy and complicated, but what does that look like on the user end? On the user end, it looks like an interest-bearing account that potentially pays much better interest than a bank. But your principal is locked in there. Correct. And in exchange for, for locking in your principal, which can be unlocked at any time, the payments just stop uh, if, if you unlock your principal. In exchange for locking in the principal uh, and showing that you have a stake in the network, which is exactly what masternodes do, you also get proportional voting rights. This, you have to swap out those. You've got to have a thousand, and you take out, say you've got 250. Mm -hmm. Does somebody else got to go in and replace you to maintain that 1,000? Yeah, I think that, like the protocol will probably search out. Uh, yeah, I doubt it. I doubt it would be manual. That would be like a oh, no, it would be all of them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and if you care to ask for specifications, um, I, I will have another interview with Evan Duffield in the coming weeks, I believe. So if you'd like to stay tuned to Dash Detailed, I would like to get some more details mm -hmm. on this myself. And so basically with this, with this ability to have an interest-bearing account that pays probably more than bank accounts pay in interest on savings, all the while this is also decentralizing and growing our infrastructure, I think that Dash probably has the best recipe to succeed at this point, which is why I'm very glad and eager to continue working for them. Um, and then, of course, the, the tie-in to why Justin has brought us all here tonight is that it is this sort of user base, like the moms, the grandmas, the whomever. Like, it's, it's everybody feeling comfortable to use this system that will provide privacy for those of us who want it because I neglected to mention this, but in evolution, uh, user funds will be private and mixed automatically. You don't have to be like, Grandma, be sure to mix your coins. Like, it'll be done automatically so that, as Justin pointed out, it's not like the sore thumb problem, like, oh, I forgot to mix my coins, now my trans, or, or rather, not enough other people are mixing their coins, but I did, and now my transactions stand out. It'll be automatically done so that we we'll eliminate that problem. And so, yeah, so that, that is basically Dash. Um, what about the accessibility for foreign users? Yes, I was just going to say I'm about to start a Q&A. Uh, Pete, before I take this gentleman's question, should people um, just like speak or would you like them to speak into any kind of recording device? Yeah, if you could just speak loudly, I'll just shot the mic should be pretty good. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Um, would you please ask that again? And, and sure. again, I'll take anybody's questions uh, henceforth. Um, what about the... Or <laughs> I'm going to try and phrase it good, all right. Um, Please. For uh, the accessibility for foreign users, um, how is Dash able for people in other countries, um, they may have like a different intuitive way of navigating on the platform, does it take that into account? I would think so. Uh, we have developers living on probably like every continent, not Antarctica. Um, but the thing with, uh, as I mentioned, any evolution apps, be they web-based or mobile-based, uh, will all be using the same DAPI, the same decentralized API. So as long as they're all using the API, they can design their user interface however they think best suits their local market. <coughs> is, um, is there a mobile wallet now for Dash? There is. On Android, there are Oh, there, there are at least yeah. four. I mean, the, the Dash specific one is by Hash Engineering. That's the name of the developers. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just called Dash Wallet. What would you recommend? Jax supports it as well. I yeah, I've got Jax. I would, I would, it's hard to say. The last time I opened, I'm not a big mobile user for my crypto. Uh, um, the last I heard, like, there were, like, some bugs that made the sync take forever in the hash engineering wallet, but last I heard they fixed that. So I would probably say the, you'll get the most functionality out of the Dash wallet on Android because they have implemented instant send, which means like if you wanted to send it to me to uh, buy my car or something, and I'm like, Doug, I'm not going to let you take off till I get a confirmation, 
uh, we could use instant send like on mobile and I could get that instant confirmation and we could know that we're good. Um, at this time, I don't believe there are any mobile wallets which offer private send mixing. That is still limited to the core wallet, which you can find at dash.org slash downloads. So at this current time of limited functionality, if you want the privacy, you'll want to like mix your coins in your core wallet, desktop wallet, and then like transfer those to your mobile device, which you can then send on out. But eventually, of course, this would all have to be mobile, otherwise, as it. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll have a follow-up oh. question. Oh, um, please. Yeah, uh, so this is the first time I'm hearing about the mixing uh, feature. Okay. I was wondering if you could talk more about what exactly gets mixed together during that process. Is it like the, the, the hashes of the wallet of the keys or something? And I don't know. I don't know if it's like, like a secondary private key, because I know in Dash there are secondary private keys, which is what allows people for example, to have a, like a VPS host their master node for them. Like they don't have to give the private keys for their thousand dash to you know, digital ocean or whatever. There's like a secondary private key that they can load up to their instance uh, on digital ocean that like proves cryptographically like, yes, this wallet is the owner of these thousand dash, but it's not let the private key that would enable someone to like spend it. And so I honestly don't know. All I know is that during the private send mixing, um, you like your private keys never go anywhere. So I, I honestly like if you figure out how, exactly how this works, would you just send an email to Amanda at dash.org <laughs> and just explain it to me? I would be elated. Thank you. <laughs> Please, Jeff. Greg. Yes, Greg. Um, I'm going to ask you again about wallets here, but I uh, also want to know what a VPS is. Yes. But I first want to thank you for coming to Minnesota, and I think it's really uh, an embodiment of what you're talking about of running a business that you're taking this initiative to come out and talk to the public at large. So thank oh. you very much. Oh, thanks, Greg. Uh, so the question is, uh, I, I hold a fair amount of Dash, and it's uh, using the Dash wallet, but it's on a publicly accessible uh, computer that I own. Is there no hardware wallet? And the other question then was, um, what is a VPS? Yeah. No, Greg, you're in luck. Trezor supports Dash. It does. Mm -hmm. um, has for maybe since this year, early year this year. Um, so I think they're in the process of like, I don't know if it's for all operating systems or what. Last time I heard there was like some update that needed to be done for Dash. In short, it would come down to what your operating system is, whether it's like good to go right now or whether there's this last fix coming through the pipelines. But yeah. Dash on a Trezor. For anybody who doesn't know what a hardware wallet is, what Greg is asking about is their little devices, or like plastic or, or metal, I don't know, um, but they like store your private keys in them so that even if your computer was full of the worst kind of malware, um, you can still like send and receive transactions without exposing your private key to that computer so that no one can steal your funds. It's awesome. Like I swear, I almost see a future in which like, like a treasure is as common as like a, like the wallet that people have in their back pockets right now. It it, it, se it seems like it's going to make the most sense. Open Dime is already a little tiny USB thing. It's called Open Dime. Oh, that's right. I've heard yeah. of that. Yeah. You break it off. And yeah. So so there's the treasure and the wallet that you'll want to use with that and download is called Electrum, but Dash Electrum is what it's called. Um, and then there's also a key key. Hardware wallet integration coming out for Dash. Um, KeepKey is appealing to many, at least because I think it's like, cheaper than Trezor. Um, and prob probably more will come. But yeah, at this time, at least Trezor, uh, KeepKey is forthcoming. If you'd like more details on that, feel free to email me. I'd be happy to point you more in the right direction. And a VPS, Greg, is, I'm sorry for having used that lingo. Uh, VPS stands for a virtual private server, which is basically just where if you want to like host some data, and hosting data can be as simple as like keeping the picture of you and and your friends at Disneyland. Like hosting data just means like where does that particular file live? And for a lot of people who run, for example, Dash masternodes, instead of hosting it out of their house, meaning you know their wallet would have to be open. 
Uh, they would need to make sure their bandwidth and electricity was uninterrupted, et cetera, et cetera. They instead just choose to host that on like, I don't know, like, I don't know if Amazon Web Services does anything that's not enterprise, do they? Yeah. Okay, so maybe like Amazon Web Services or some other popular ones are called like DigitalOcean or Volter. Um, and in Dash, there also just so happen to be several VPSs which have cropped up just in the past couple of years, which are masternode specific. So like if you call Amazon and you're like, Amazon, I want to launch a Dash masternode, like they're not going to know what that is. They certainly won't be capable of giving you any support. Um, but with these masternode specific VPSs, they have like these web interfaces that basically just give you like the old like click here, one, two, three, and tell us this, and then it's done. So it's just much easier to launch a masternode on that kind of VPS than it is a agnostic one. Yeah. Um, so if you're hosting a masternode with a VPS, mm -hmm. is there any threat of the VPS keeping logs of what you're doing with the masternode, or are those kept within the Dash network? I have no idea. That's a good question. I would love to see that asked on Reddit. Um, I don't know if you use Reddit at all. I'm a large yeah. fan myself. <laughs> you do? I don't know if you ever come to the Dash subreddit, Justin, but if you don't, I would love to see you there. Um, it's reddit.com slash r slash dash pay. And I'm sure that's something that would get some very decent traction there and I would be interested to know myself. Um, in the case that you're asking about, could that stand to compromise private send transactions, basically? Because, yeah, as you say, if the VPS is keeping a log of, like, whichever coins have been, like, swap doodled there, I think that's why in forthcoming versions of Dash, uh, there will be a default of, like, a minimum number of mixes because it's like hops, like the mixing can take and should take place in hops. Like it shouldn't just be like one round of mixing and then we're done. Because as you said, if a log was being kept of that round of mixing, didn't accomplish a lot there. Um, but in, on the Dash protocol, you can have like up to eight hops. And so as long as like all eight master nodes were not randomly selected that were owned by one malicious person who was keeping copious logs, then, then you're golden. Yeah. Yes, David. <coughs> yes. Um, do, can you launch a node that is not a master? So if I want to launch a full node on the Bitcoin network right now, mm -hmm. all I've got to do is go download Bitcoin Unlimited mm -hmm. or Bitcoin Core or Bitcoin yep. Classic. You can totally do that with Dash. And um, do those nodes get any in, uh, get any incentive for running non-master nodes? So I don't have ten thousand, uh, excuse me, a thousand dash, mm -hmm. but I want to run a node. Mm -hmm. Do I get uh, any kind of incentive to, to do that or no? At this time, uh, before the decentralized master node shares launch in 2018, probably as I had mentioned earlier, at this time. The only way to be uh, incentivized, and actually you don't even have to run a full node if you don't want to, uh, in that some people are pooling their dash already uh, to get the full thousand to then split the payouts. And because they all have to live in a single address, uh, these people who are pooling are in essence trusting each other, of course, trusting that whoever holds the private key to that thousand dash will continue to send proportional payouts to everybody who shares in it. So that is the only option at this time. Um, and if you're interested in any of those trusted options, there are a couple of guys at least who have been running trusted share services for like well over a year. Um, they're pretty like OG, have been around for a while. I would be very, very surprised if they did not continue to send people their payouts until the trustless option comes out. Um, if you're interested in that, I listed the URLs of those two service providers in the Dash Details episode that I published on YouTube today. It's in the description section. Yeah. So this uh, piggies back perfect on this last question there. Uh, Please. I like how you explain the incentive structure between uh, paying the developers and paying the uh, full nodes and the miners as well. I'm wondering, do you know if Satoshi talked about that uh, in the white paper at all, or, or the community in Bitcoin? And also, uh, to piggyback on that, is, is the Bitcoin community themselves looking at what, where is the incentives going to come from in the Bitcoin community now that the miners are sort of centralized? Well, the incentives in Bitcoin are very much there, but they're in very different places than was perhaps originally imagined. Um, at this time, the primary incentives 
seem to be coming from basically people with banking ties who are like, we would love to make Bitcoin our back end and we would love to be Bitcoin banks and we would love for people to keep using us as banks except we'll be using Bitcoin and, and we'll be, I don't know, some lightning hubs, Bitcoin lightning network hubs. And that, that's basically a, like a Bitcoin bank. And so it's very much, the incentives are there, but the incentives to be a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system as outlined by Satoshi are no longer there. Um, did Satoshi talk about in his white paper paying developers? No. He talked about paying, as I said, like full nodes and miners used to be the same thing. So he did envision a fully incentivized infrastructure at least. And yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that um, had he stuck around, maybe he would have seen the need for developers to receive a part of this reward. Either that, or maybe he just envisioned like, I think he envisioned everybody keeping their Bitcoins, right? Because he says in his white paper, um, in terms of like protecting against the 51% mining attack, he says that if any person has enough hashing power to like subvert the blockchain like that, he should be incentivized enough by like how much bank he's making and how much bitcoins he potentially holds to like keep the system honest. But it would appear that many, if not most, miners just sell everything that they mine straight into fiat. And what's more, their mining machines can be repurposed to different networks quite frequently, especially if it's GPU mining. Like you don't have the long-term interest of any single network at heart. And you can switch your machine to mine for any other competing network. So, and 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 to to more fully follow up, like I don't I don't think that anything is a finished product. Everything can be improved, and I think that Dash is what Bitcoin, what Satoshi would have made Bitcoin to be basically if he stuck around. Like I really think, like I love Bitcoin. It's awesome. The reason I work for Dash is it's because I what I wanted Bitcoin to become, and I just. Bitcoin just like, it's pretty much the same today as it was in January 2009. And so I think if it had continued to improve, like any, any competitive system has to improve to keep competing with others, it would look a lot like Dash. Why do you think it didn't? Governance. Yeah, well, no, because the governance is, the governance is, should have been developed. The question is why wasn't it? Well, then maybe then. maybe Gavin Andreessen, maybe he was like more of like a like a like a code guy or something. Like this was one thing I noticed about Evan Duffield, like the the lead developer of Dash. He like I don't know what kind of business he was in like before he became a crypto dude, but like the way he talks, he like talks about like incentives and like uh, supply demand equilibrium and like do 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 and he like talks like he like knows how economics works and so it just appears that for whatever reason be it probably just chance that the development that came into bitcoin within its first one two to three years it just so happens that those guys didn't have a firm grasp of supply and demand Yeah, um, I'm gonna take yes, one more question, and then I don't, I don't want to hold y'all here all night. I'm gonna take your question as a final question, and then we'll be finished. And anyone who would like to chat afterward, I'll be here. All right. So uh, it'll be about voting, but it'll probably also be just about how you got your job here within Dash. So um, tell me from the user experience, how did, how did you make the proposal to the community? Mm -hmm. How was it voted on? How, how do I see that? And at what threshold of voting then did you have to achieve in order to get paid? Yeah, will do. So I put in my first proposal, which was a three month payout proposal, I guess like four months ago. Um, and so basically the way anyone can put a proposal into the Dash network, and actually I've made a video tutorial about how to do this, should any of you ever want to put in a proposal to get money from Dash's treasury. Um, you can issue all of the commands from your Dash core wallet if you want. There's an easier way. Um, there are basically various websites, one in particular called dashcentral.org, where again, they'll just like baby step you through it. So I created an account at dashcentral.org, 
it asked me to pay my proposal fee. This fee exists to protect against like DOS you know, floods, right? Um, at the time, it was 5 Dash in the next version of Dash in 12.1 that will come out within a number of months. That fee will go way down to a third of a Dash, which will be nice. Um, so the, the website, dashcentral.org, is like, okay, go to your wallet and send your 5 Dash proposal fee um, to like such and such an address. That gets burned. And then, um, then the website says, okay, now, um, use your core client's signing like mechanism to take the private key of the address you just sent from and like sign sign this message from our website. And you do that, and then their servers like pick it up within 30 minutes, and your your template, your blank proposal template, is basically now listed there, and it's recorded in the blockchain that it now exists. And when that happens, you can like fill in the text with like your pitch. You're like, hey, I'm Remind me of what your name was? Ryan Fox. Yeah, you'll be like, hey, I'm Ryan Fox, and this is what I think I can do for the Dash network, and here's, you know, here's my specifications for the work I want to do, here's a, a, my brief experience, um, and I want you to pay me X number of Dash for the next X number of months to do it. And then that gets posted, and I, I usually cross-post my proposals to Reddit, also like the Dash Pace of Reddit. Um, I tweet them. Um, and then from that point, anybody who has a master node, uh, the, the voting cycles and payout cycles take place roughly like every month. Um, so I would recommend putting in your proposal earlier in the month so that people have more days to read it and potentially vote yes for it, hopefully. And then the voting threshold is that there must be 10% more yeses than noes. So if nobody were to vote no on your proposal, we have roughly 4,000 master nodes. You would need 400 yes votes for that to be yes and paid out automatically by the next what we call super block. Happens once a month. Like I said, it's like mining. You used to look on the block, the block explorer, and you're like, "Wow, those are brand new coins." Um, and yeah, and so I think that answered all of your questions. The voting threshold and and, and how can you view them? I think you, I mean, no, I don't think, I know you can view all of the proposals like from your core client as well. Like if you know whatever command you need, like master node list proposals, I don't know what the command is, but you could view them that way. And then there are various websites um, like dashvotetracker.com will list everything that's up for a vote right now, show the comments, show the current yes to, yes to no's, et cetera. It's almost like the DAO, yes. except it works. <laughs> yes. Yeah, maybe just worth mentioning too. It's not just sufficient to have ten percent more yeses than noes. If if the total dash payouts, you know, like it'll go oh, by priorities. True. So so the, of course the treasury is a is a fixed ten percent of our block award, and that decreases by seven percent every year. Currently, ten percent of our block reward each month is seven thousand four hundred and forty nine dash. So, on occasion, it does happen that more proposals are not only put in, but voted yes on for more, asking for more dash than we even have in the Treasury that month. And in that case, those which have the most yeses to noes will get funded until all of the funds run out. Yeah. Hey, everybody, can we just give a little round of applause to Pete, who always works in the background? <laughs> Detailed. You can find us on YouTube. We publish every Wednesday, and I very much appreciate you being here.